Um, here we are on Saturday the 16th of November. I'm interviewing Professor Ronan Fanning from University College Dublin on the occasion of the Irish Studies Conference here at St Mary's University College. First of all, Professor Fanning, thank you for agreeing to speak, to be our keynote speaker here at St Mary's University College. Pleasure, real pleasure. Um, the first question I'd like to ask you uh, relates to your most recent book, uh, Fatal Path, British Government and Irish Revolution, 1910 to 1922. I notice that uh, you dedicate the book to your uh, Irish mother and uh, English father. Other way round, English mother. And uh, I knew father. I'd get it wrong. <laughs> <laughs> to your um, English mother. mother and Irish father. Right. Yes. Uh, and I wondered, first of all, what the significance of that was, of that dedication, in the context of the book you've just written. Well, what put it into my head was, uh, perhaps I'd just say something by way of background about my parents. My, my father was a doctor, and like so many Irish doctors in, in the 20s, he went to Yorkshire, he was attached to a TB sanitarium, and he met my mother, who was a Montessori teacher uh, in Hull, and, well, they ended up by getting married about 10 years afterwards, in, in 1940. And my mother came to, to Ireland, we lived in Ireland. My father got a job, he was a professional civil servant on the medical side of the Department of Health. Uh, and my father was a fairly anglophile, there was never any tension in our house, Irish-English kind of tension. I mean, we listened to the BBC rather than to Irish radio most of the time. Uh, but I suppose the reason for the dedication was, I remember one occasion, I used to write fairly regularly during the worst of the IRA's long war in Northern Ireland in the 70s and 80s on British-Irish relations. I'd write almost every week for the Sunday Independent. And after my mother read one of my articles, in which I can't remember what the subject was, but I was castigating the British government for something or other. She gently reminded me, she said, after all, Ronan, you're, you're half English. So I just laughed and I said, well, you know, there comes a point, Ma, when you have to make a choice. Uh, and I see myself as Irish. Now, it so happens, I have a brother, my, my next brother, Adrian, who, he's, been, he's been living in London since the early 60s. And his children, were, he married an Irish girl who came over to London with him. Uh, but he would, I think, regard himself as English rather mm -hmm. than Irish. Certainly his children would regard themselves as mm -hmm. English rather than, than Irish. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I don't think you can really be half anything. My, my own son has said to me that he thinks one of the reasons for what he was kind enough as to to praise, and it's very difficult to win praise from one's children, um, as the uh, dispassion of the book, was that while I might not be half Irish or half English, my background did mean I had a capacity for seeing into both sides. Mm -hmm. And of course the book is, even though the s subject is Ireland, Irish Revolution, the book is a study in British high politics. Mm -hmm. Mm. which was my PhD thesis. It began as my PhD thesis, the, mm. the 1906 to 1911 part, mm. when I went to Cambridge in the, in the early 60s. Mm. In fact, you've answered the, uh, the question I was going to ask you next. Do you regard yourself as Irish or British? You've answered that. Oh, no, I would regard myself as Irish, mm. uh, unequivocally Irish. Yeah. Okay. But I don't have any, I don't have any issues. Mm. I mean, as I say, my other brother would probably regard himself as, I think he'd be more inclined to regard himself as English mm. rather than British. Can I ask I, you? And my third brother, who yes. lives in, in, in Ireland, is an absolutely thoroughgoing Anglophile and a member of the MCC. Right. <laughs> Do you think in this day and age it's possible, I suppose thinking in the context of Northern Ireland, is, is it still possible to be Irish and British? Oh, absolutely. Mm. Absolutely. In, 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 yes, it is. Mm. And I dare say, if I'd been born in Northern Ireland or reared in Northern Ireland, th that would probably be my position. Mm. Mm. But since I'm not, I mean, I am actually because I was born before the Republic of Ireland Act in 1948. Yes. And I'm entitled to a British passport. Oh, obviously. Of course, yes. Uh, yes. But I mean, I'm, but I, I think if I had 
been brought up in Belfast as opposed to Dublin. I would regard myself as Irish and British, British. but it doesn't really make any sense to regard yourself as Irish and British if you've been living in independent Ireland all your life. Okay, fine. Could you tell us why you became a historian and how you went about it? Well, I, when I went to university, University College did Dublin in the first instance, I, I um, wanted to do English. And there was one very fine lecturer who I still keep in touch with. He's, he's still lecturing in New York in his 80s, Dennis Dunham. But the rest of the English department in those days, in the early 60s, were really pretty terrible. And, and they regarded the lectures as an occasion to read out extracts from the edition that they had produced for a Dublin publisher of Macbeth or Newman's idea of a university. Mm. They just literally read chunks out of these various books which were set texts. They were terrible. Mm. And there was also huge tracts you had to do of Anglo-Saxon and Old English. So after a year of this, I decided the history department was then very advanced by the standards of the Faculty of Arts. It was the only department in UCD which had a tutorial system as it would be understood later on. And I suddenly realised at the end of the year that I'd been taught by three or four senior members of the department. They all knew my name. Nobody knew who I was in English, so mm. I switched them to single subject history and became utterly hooked on it. And um, then I was fortunate enough to get a first class honours degree in history. And as a result of that, I was, I was elected to a research studentship by Peterhouse in Cambridge, which had ties with my college going with UCD going back to the 1940s. Right. Okay. Before I talk to you about your book, um, you're, you're Emeritus Professor of History, yeah. of Modern History at UCD. Um, can you tell us what you do at the moment in that, uh, in that role, and also what you do as um, Director of Archives uh, at UCD? Well, Director of Archives, I'm, I'm not really Director of Archives. I, I was when I retired five or six years ago. I, I, I was Director of Archives Acquisition. Mm. And what that meant was keeping my eyes open for any uh, collection which might be coming up. Uh, there was a very important uh, collection that I organised it, it, it's, that it should go to UCD, the papers of a civil servant called Dermot Nally. Mm -hmm. He was the alter ego of Robert Armstrong mm -hmm. in the so-called Armstrong-Nally talks, which led to the Anglo-Irish Agreement in 1985. Mm -hmm. And we also acquired the papers of the Progressive Democratic Party for the archives of UCD. But in fact, that role of acquisition I'm not really involved in that very much now because I was getting paid a small amount of money, part-time contract, but when the recession really hit, the new rubric was that if you were in receipt of a full-time pension from a public body, mm. then you couldn't also be in receipt of a part-time contract simultaneously, mm. which in view of the crisis we were undergoing was fair enough. Mm. So although I have sort of a small foot in the ring, I, I'm not really doing anything in U UCD anymore. Mm. So I'm free to concentrate on my own writing and my right. research, which is yeah. what I'm doing, which is why Fatal Path, which in various shapes and forms had been on these stocks for a very long time, I finally got around to finishing it. Right. And um, you're a member of the Royal Irish Academy. Yes. Um, in, in, a, in a practical sense, what does that involve at the moment? Well, in a practical sense, I, I was I was elected to that really on the strength of my first book, which was the History of the Irish Department of Finance, which was a groundbreaking book published in the end of the 70s, because at that stage, nobody had been in, there was no Archives Act, there was no release of records, statutory release of records in Ireland. And it was the first time a historian had ever been let in to the records of the government department. Mm. And that was a tremendous opportunity. It was a very difficult task because I had to be my own researcher, I even had to be my own messenger and go down to the bowels of the earth because mm. the messengers in the Department of Finance were not keen on being asked to bring 50, 60 files a day. Mm. I would only be interested in two of them and say mm. you can take the rest back. Uh, so that was an extraordinary task and it ended up sort of very hefty tome of about 720 pages. Uh, and it was on the strength of that I became a member of the Academy. And in the Academy, 
I was secretary and subsequently chairman of the Committee for the Study of International Relations. I've always been interested in Anglo-Irish relations, mm -hmm. Anglo-American relations, international relations generally. And again at that stage there wasn't an institute for international relations in Ireland. So the best we could do was come, and come up with what was called the National Committee in for the study of international relations. And that was housed, as it were, in the academy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And as a result of that, I became secretary for the humanities in the academy. Uh, extraordinary a, a title that I greatly enjoyed, I must say, the secretary, secretary for Polite Literature and Antiquities in the Royal Irish Academy, title for back to up to you. So I was involved in the, and I'm still on the publications committee of the academy, right. but I'm not as actively involved in it. I mean, I've more or less reached the stage where I, I'm downplaying the amount okay. administration that I get involved in, I feel I've right. done my bit. Okay, and, and your role as a member of the board of the Directory of Irish Biography, is that still active? That, well, that is still active. Yeah. We're meeting twice a year, but the, the, the Dictionary of Irish Biography, that came out, the nine volumes came out, um, and I was the 20th century editor, and I did some of the major contributions. Uh, I did De Valera, well, the entries on De Valera, about Jack Lynch, the Mass, mm -hmm. Richard Mulcahy. Uh, and I also read all the 20th century entries and uh, made some changes in some of them, not that many, the, mm. the standard was, was very high. Um, so that's much slimmed down operation now, but we're still bringing it up to date online. Mm. So there are online entries going in, but I'm not writing any of them at the moment. I okay. might occasionally do it in the future. But. Okay, and finally, before I do move on to the book. Um, And finally, before I do move on to the book, <laughs> that's one of our lecturers, um, your work on the documents and Irish foreign policy. Well, that's very much an ongoing yeah. project. Yeah. In fact, there was a meeting of the editorial board yesterday, which I missed because I was coming to the London. Um, and that's a project, we've published eight volumes, and it comes out every two years like clockwork. Mm. We've got a very good executive editor, a man called Michael Kennedy, Dr. Kennedy, and he's um, He's the only full-time, uh, he and, and one assistant, they're the only full-time members of the project. So it's a run on a shoestring. And then the other editors are people like myself, you know, Halpin is Professor of Contemporary Irish History in, in uh, Trinity, mm. Katrina Crowe is in the National Archives. Uh, and it, it's a tri, there are three partners in the project really, there's the Academy, there's the Department of Foreign Affairs, which has been extraordinarily cooperative from making their records available, and the National Archives, mm -hmm. and that's where the records actually are, so that's where we work mm -hmm. out. Mm -hmm. So that's an ongoing thing. We meet about four or five times a year, mm -hmm. and I'm very much involved in the choice of the documents mm -hmm. for each volume as it comes out. Okay. I am now going to move on to your book, Fatal Path. Now, uh, I found it fascinating. I'm going to ask you a number of perhaps what might be considered provocative questions. Well, certainly the first one is, I find it quite ironic uh, and a bit of a paradox that somebody who, when I was uh, growing up academically, was described as a revisionist historian, um, should state quite categorically, and obviously this is going to be the subject of your talk this afternoon, that uh, without violence or the threat of violence in Ireland, north and south, between 1912 and 1922, um, the British government uh, of the day, or British governments of the day, would not have moved on from the pre-First World War Home Rule offer as exemplified in the 1920 Government of Ireland Act. Is, is that not a, a supreme irony that you should be Well, I don't that? think it is. I, I think there's, a, there's certainly a misunderstanding, not a, a misunderstanding to which I may have contributed in some degree, in, in part, but there is a misunderstanding of my position. You see, I think the term revisionist, it was when it first surfaced, and as it's as it was initially most commonly used. It was basically used as a term of abuse. Mm. It was used as a term of abuse in the same way that Marxists, hardline Marxists, used a revisionist as a term of abuse. In other words, you were departing from the party line. The party line was that everything was great and glorious about the revolution, mm. 
and that you didn't question anything about it or challenge anything about it. Mm. Now, in the sense that I didn't buy that, and I didn't buy into the Republican interpretation of the provisional IRA interpretation of Irish history, I was a revisionist in that sense. But I always had, and, and you will find this in articles I've written and essays I've written going back 15, 20 years, I always had sharp differences of opinion with, for example, people like Roy Foster, people like Charles Townsend, but especially perhaps Roy Foster, who's regarded as, as, as you know, the, I suppose, the most eminent Irish historian here. Um, and, um, for example, one of the things, I remember when um, Neil Jordan's film on Michael Collins came out, which was some years ago, I wrote a review of that uh, as history. And I said, by and large, he got it absolutely right. There were a couple of things in it which he put in, such as placing de Valera at the scene of the ambush, which was nonsense. He dragged him in Northern Ireland gratuitously by the scruff of the neck in one scene, which was nonsense. Mm -hmm. But the main pivotal point of the movie was that it was what happened on Bloody Sunday in the intelligence war, that that changed everything. Mm -hmm. and, and that it was from that point on that the British government re realized there was no longer any point about ending the war in a month, having murder by the throat, mm. uh, as Lloyd George said at the Lord Mayor's banquet at the beginning of November. There's no more talk of that after those two weekends in November 1921. Mm. Mm. Bloody Sunday first, and then the following weekend, the Kilmichael ambush, which, as Lloyd George again pointed out, was of a very different nature. Of, that was a military operation mm. rather than just sort of random. Mm. assassinations or an ambush. Mm. So I think in that sense I, I've always taken a somewhat different line. Where I think my being labelled a revisionist is, is, is partly um, my own responsibility is that I suppose I was inhibited, not quite as inhibited perhaps, but I was inhibited um, by the fact that the release of British papers for this period um, more or less precisely coincided with the IRAs getting up and running mm. in, in the war of the 1970s. And therefore, there was this feeling that, you know, you shouldn't write things which gave comfort to the provisional IRA's uh, view of things. Mm. Uh, and I may, I won't say unnecessarily regret playing that low-key at the time because it was a very tense time, it was a very difficult time. It was a very difficult time, I mean, I remember the Bobby Sands hunger strike, for example, I remember it was a very difficult time to lecture on British-Irish relations at an Irish university, feeling was running very high. Um, and I think that's one of the reasons why I tended to downplay it, but when I finally retired and decided I was going to put this book together, I mean, Many of the chapters, not all of them, have been published in a much more academic form mm. in <coughs> journals. Well, there was, a, there was, a, there was a, a volume of essays to mark the end of the Union brought out jointly by the British Academy and the Royal Irish Academy. And I have an essay in that, mm. which is very much about the 1920 Act, and which basically says, I say in, in the book. Mm. And Roy Foster has an essay in that, which again, the emphasis is very different. Mm. So I can understand, it, it is ironic if you think of, okay, Foster, Townsend, Fitzpatrick, Fanning, they're all revisionists. Mm. It's ironic if you put me into that category, but I don't, I never have put myself into that category. Okay, let, now, I have to say, <laughs> At one level, this is a profoundly depressing book yes. in the sense that absolutely nobody seems to come out of it um, very well at all. Um, if we start with Asquith and Lloyd George, I mean, the question I want to ask you there, you state that you know, they're, 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 their major concern is that they want to stay in power, it's political survival, and they're not going to do anything on Ireland that's going to, uh, to undermine that or threaten that. Um, what I wanted to ask you was, then they're not unique. That's what politicians no. do. Exactly. Um, exactly. So we can't. On on one level, we can criticise them for their uh, 
the lack of uh, bravery uh, and the lack of initiative. But on the other hand, we couldn't. Can we expect them to have done anything else no. in the context of no. the time? No. no, no, not unless you've got a much more idealistic view of politicians that than I do. Right. From what you've just said to me, I suspect that you, you do. In fact, that's one of the interesting things about the book. I was giving a talk at a book festival during the summer and um, I just had come up to, I was saying to the organisers I was there, and there was a chap buying a t -t ticket in the office and he said, oh, he said, I suppose it's going to be more of the usual Brit bashing. Mm. And I said, well, no, it isn't actually Brit bashing. But when I began my talk that afternoon, I began by telling the story and by saying quite specifically that I didn't regard the book as Brit bashing. Because if you see people putting things on the long finger, and which is the thing I remind Irish audiences of, which they don't like instantly, but I take great pleasure in reminding them of it, that, I mean, this is precisely what politicians do. I mean, the, the default mode of virtually all politicians in parliamentary democracies is always put off till tomorrow, mm. what you don't have to do today. And the more difficult and the more intractable a problem is, the stronger the inducement is to kick it into touch. Mm. And if it's a problem that if you get it wrong, that there's a risk of imperiling your parliamentary majority, well then you certainly kick it into touch. Mm. Mm. And Asquith was, was his policy, I mean, you can say that the, the, the Home Rule Bill 1912-14 and, and the 1920 bill, the Go Government of Ireland bill, which became the Government of Ireland, um, they're both exercises in hypocrisy, in the sense that the government, Asquith and his senior ministers, never anticipated that the Third Home Rule Bill would be enacted in the form in which it was introduced. Mm. They realised the subject of the exclusion of Ulster would have to be mm. addressed. Mm. The Government of Ireland Act, it was the other way around. The Government realised before it had even been introduced again, before it had been enacted, that there wasn't the remotest chance of Sinn Féin's ever accepting it. Mm -hmm. But it got, it solved the problem of Ulster. Mm -hmm. And by that stage, of course, the Ulster Unionists were in the driving seat because the Conservatives and the Unionists now have an overall majority. Mm. Not just hold the balance of power, but they have an overall majority in the House of Commons. So if they don't like what Lloyd is doing, Lloyd George is doing, they just pitch him out. Yeah, yeah. And and so therefore he has to get the Ulster monkey off his back. But Lloyd George was prepared. Lloyd George is talking before even the general election in 1918, because in those days the, the, there were no opinion polls, and the guide to public opinion was by elections. Mm. And Lloyd. And George, Lloyd George saw the way the by-elections had been going in 1917, 18. And he confided to some of the Liberals privately. Mm. You see, there's this, this disparity which comes out again and again in the book between what people think privately and what they say publicly. Mm. But there again, I take your point. I mean, I don't think politics is very different. I mean, I, I don't know. I like to be a fly on the wall <laughs> when, say, Cameron and... Osborne are talking about the European re yeah. referendum. Yeah. I'm abs the one thing I'm absolutely certain of is they haven't said publicly what they intend to do. I don't know what they intend mm. to do, but I'm certain they haven't said publicly what they intend to do. But it seems to me that there's a certain Irish nationalist myopia about uh, the, the good intentions of, of uh, in particular, liberal politicians, British liberal politicians. Um, do, do you think that they were living, both the politicians themselves, Asquith and Lloyd George, were in a sense living under the, the shadow of Gladstone, because I noticed that your first chapter there is about the Gladstonian legacy, and do you think people like Redmond um, were completely naive and unrealistic in that they believed that Asquith's uh, uh, role was to carry out the unfinished work uh, of Gladstone? They, they weren't that night. There comes a point where it does appear very naive and possibly by 1912-13 you could say by 1913 it, it was naive but the real difficulty is the the ultimate problem in Ireland from the middle of the 1880s on is always going to be Ulster that's the intractable bit that's the hard bit 
ultimately, the major British parties did not object. They didn't particularly like it because no politician likes relinquishing powers over territories unless they have to. But they were ready to give some kind of self-government, whether you call it home rule or whatever you call it, dominion, mm. republic. They were prepared to give some kind of self-government to what you might describe as a nationalist Ireland. But what they were not prepared to do was to allow nationalist Ireland, a parliament in Dublin, control, bring the unionists, the Protestants, because the, the Protestant Catholic thing is very significant. I try to bring that out in the book. I think well, one of the things I think that does come out of the book, and that, that I try to bring out in the book, uh, and that I think John Redmond and his colleagues didn't like to face up to, uh, was that the liberals are just as anti-Catholic, if not more anti-Catholic yeah. than the Protestants. Mm -hmm. Than the Conservatives. Sorry, yeah. yes, than the Conservatives. Mm -hmm. They're more anti-Catholic than the Conservatives. And if you look, you see, a, an issue like denominational education. Well, Redmond and the Irish Parliamentary Party and, and, and the Tories are on the same mm -hmm. side. They both want denominational education. Because in Ireland that means Catholic education. Yeah. And in England means Church of England. Mm -hmm. So they both want the licensing legislations, the licensing acts. There's a whole range of things, economic policies, a whole range of things. The only issue on which there is this alliance, but it's the, the most important issue, because it's what's been described by one historian as a millennial issue, is the issue of home rule. Mm -hmm. And, and Asquith has inherited that. But the trouble is, because of what happened in 1886, and because of what happens over the next 25 years, there is, and I feel this now, having had various discussions of these points since the book's publication, if I were writing it again, I'd put it more forcefully than I do in the book. There's almost a, a sort of tacit conspiracy between the major political parties not to identify Ulster as the real issue. Mm. And the reason for that is, well, in the case of the Liberals, they know they're going to need the support of the Irish Parliamentary Party. Mm -hmm. And they know the Irish Parliamentary Party are going to get upset if they say, well, you can have home rule, but Ulster isn't going to be part of it. So they push that onto the back burner. Mm -hmm. The Irish Parliamentary Party, Joe Devlin advising Redmond, say it's all bluff, it's all nonsense. So they don't want to talk about it. But the interesting thing is that the Ulster Unionists don't want to talk about it either. Because for as long as they can use the ordinary processes of parliamentary democracy to defeat home rule, mm. they're perfectly happy with that. Mm. Mm. And that's the reason you see, I mean, the first home rule bill, I mean, Gladstone was so, however messianic he may have been, and however noble spirit, he was so utterly inept, he didn't even get the bill through the second reading in the House of Commons. Mm. Mm. So that collapses at the very first hour. Mm. Mm. The Liberal Party splits out of office for 20 years. Yeah. Asquith, bright young man, the most brilliant member of Glaston's camp, ferociously resentful mm -hmm. that Ireland has forced him out of office. And um, so the Ulster Unionists, until, and then they see in 1893, bill thrown out, well, the bill thrown out by the House of Lords. And Unionists realise for as long as the, the House of Lords is there, mm. they're, they're safe. So there's no problem until 1911, which is why I start the book in 1910. Mm -hmm. and, and, and the Tories, see, the Tories are interesting too. They don't want to talk about Ulster because they want to use, as Carson wanted to use, he failed ultimately. He wanted to use Ulster as the issue to prevent home rule being given to any part of Ireland. Yeah. So nobody wants to talk about Ulster. Right. And then when the war begins, there's another, I mean, this compromise at the beginning of the war when Asquith says, and Redmond actually proposes this, mm. he says, okay, we'll suspend the, amend we, the amending act, will be suspended. Mm. You won't bring in the act which, had been, which he promised, the bill, the suspending bill, 
which was going to provide for some form of votes for exclusion. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, as, uh, and Redmond proposes, this, okay, you won't bring that in. And in return for that, I'll agree that home rule will be put on the statute book, but it won't come into effect until after the war is over. So, Ulster just kicked into touch once again. And by the time the war is over, the Ulster Unionists have control of the House of Commons. Right. It must be a, a psychological blow to uh, Irish, read, Irish nationalist readers of your book for you to state quite categorically that uh, contrary to um, received opinion, accepted opinion, Northern Ireland was not the bit that was left over after the Irish Free State was created. It was the other way around. Absolutely. The Irish Free State was the bit that was left over after the Northern Absolutely. Ireland Ulster issue had been resolved. That, that is quite, um, uh, it's quite a dramatic statement. I think that is, I mean, I remember Joe Lee who gave it a very interesting review in the Irish Times. Mm. I mean, that, that's one of the points he made very forcefully. Mm. And I think that does shock people. Mm. But then you see, to a certain extent, part of the problem remains in, in, in the Republic of Ireland today. There are still people in the Republic of Ireland who don't recognise that Ulster Unionists are entitled to the same, the same rights of self-determination mm -hmm. as Irish nationalists. And that's where the issue lies. Are Ulster Unionists entitled to self-determination? Mm -hmm. And basically, the liberal attitude on that is not very different from the conservative attitude. Right, right. No, I, I, I can see that. Can I go back to the re revisionist controversy? Uh, in, in your um, introduction there, um, you, you, and I think you've alluded to, to it already, you, you state that in, in the Irish context, the Ir Irish historiography context, revision, revisionism seems to have been perverted, so to speak, the definition of revisionism not just uh, the uh, revising of opinions or the writing of history in the light of uh, new evidence yeah. or, um, reinterpretation. or reinterpretation, but um, trying to um, pejoratively support a position which has already been lost. What, wishful thinking, basically, yeah. that uh, a lot of revisionism in the Irish context is trying to support and promote a particular political position which has already been abandoned. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think you give us the, con uh, uh, the, the example, um, those who argue that, you know, left to its own devices without the introduction of violence, home rule could have trundled through the statutory process and, and some form of peaceful uh, uh, um, uh, independence or, 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 or devolution could have occurred in Ireland, uh, it didn't require violence, and that's you, my reading of what you've said there. That definition of uh, revisionism is, um, is, is 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 completely wrong. That's my view. Yes. that's where I would you you you, you put yeah. it extremely well. That is where I would part company, right? With with, with the royal family, and it, it dies very hard. I yes. mean, it, it's only emblematic, but it's nevertheless, I think, very significant. John Bruton, when he was Taoiseach, Fine Gael, looked to the Irish Parliamentary Party tradition. The portrait he asked to have put up in his office was John Redmond. Mm. Now, that, that's really quite meaningless as far as I'm concerned. Mm. Utterly meaningless. Mm. Mm. Well, I have to put you on the spot and ask you, despite everything you've said there, I mean, could you conjecture that um, it could have been possible to establish uh, a devolved administration in Ireland um, which would have resulted in the country remaining inside the United Kingdom. Was that at all possible? I don't think it was possible and the reason it wasn't possible was that for 30 years, I'll be using a quotation this afternoon, but for something like 30, the guts of 30 years, the Irish political demand, as repeated at general election after general election after general election, democratically expressed, peacefully expressed, was from, for home rule. And home rule was not conceded. It just peaceful, democratic means mm. simply didn't work. Mm. No home rule was given. Mm. 
Mm. Now, and the nationalists, I mean, people like Owen McNeill, Patrick Piercy, they all started out as home rulers. But when they see how effective the Ulster Unionists have been in arming themselves, in gun running, in setting up a provisional government, mm. and when the British government seemed to say, oh yeah, well, better pay attention to this, well, that penny drops pretty quickly. Mm. And they start to follow suit. And then, of course, I, I think if it hadn't been for the Great War, I mean, I think that's the imponderable. Mm. If it hadn't been for the... But, but you can't just wipe the Great War out of history. Mm. It's rather too mm. momentous in every sense mm. for that. If the Great War hadn't come, and if the crisis had to be resolved without civil war, then I think some kind of compromise would have been patched up. Mm. I think there would have been some kind of exclusion of Ulster, maybe been permanent, you know, I think probably more likely to be permanent, certainly not five years or six years or anything like that. Mm. But isn't it equally fair to say that? And I think that might, and if that had been done, and if that had been put in place, mm. if a Home Rule Parliament had been put in place, mm. but unless a Home Rule Parliament is, is put in place, but once the, once the Great War begins, well then, all bets are off. But in 1918, surely um, the bulk of Irish nationalist sentiment, uh, opinion, even uh, as exhibited at the ballot box in November 1918, was not overtly Republican. Um, weren't they voting for Sinn Féin on an emotional gut issue um, as a result of the Easter Rise in the uh, conscription controversy and all the rest of it. I think conscription, yeah, but I mean they're voting for Charles Townsend uh, in his new book, The, the Republic, he, he's quite strong on this and quite good on this. He's, what they're really voting for is independence. Mm -hmm. You see, an independence repeal for Daniel O'Connell is a word. Repeal for but for Redmond, two words. A republic is another word. And Collins himself, at one point, there are quotations which so, he says, you know, what we want is separation. Mm. What we want is control of our own affairs. Now, a Republican will pitch that higher, will pitch that demand higher mm. than, than a home ruler. But the issue is, can we be independent? Are the British going to give us back? Mm. Or, or to give us control, which we've never had? And the answer to that is, was no, 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 and no. Mm. And then, by the time the question is put in 1918, it's been the people are putting it, who have now won a democratic mandate in the 1918 election. Mm. What about the argument um, that basically the uh, more extreme Republican element in Irish nationalism staged uh, a putsch as a result of the 1918 general election? by then using that to stage a guerrilla war of independence, which nobody voted for in 1918. Mm. And as a result, uh, the Irish nationalist electorate found itself, in effect, voting for something that they never really intended to vote for in 1918. I, I don't buy, I wouldn't buy into that. Mm. Uh, I think certainly a putsch in 1960, mm. that was certainly a putsch a minority of a minority of a minority, the role of the IRB. But it was very clear, I mean, from the Clare by-election, when de Valera comes out and, and, and wins a decisive victory, a very strong Irish parliamentary party candidate, the Ditch, mm. in Clare. And that was seen, and it was seen by the Dublin Castle, as well as by, by Irish nationalists. I mean, bonfires burnt the length and breadth of the land. There was no overt violence, but and de Valera is talking in that by-election campaign, he's talking about rifles, he's talking about if we have to resort to arms, mm. then that's what it has to be. He's talking about telling people to drill with hurleys if they don't have rifles. So the whole, the whole question has changed. Mm. Mm. And, and, and you know, I, I simply don't think what was on offer. I think what was on offer in 1912-14 has just become utterly discredited. Mm. I think but the one terrible mistake I think Redmond made was not a great, not saying, look, I must have a home rule parliament immediately. The reason he made that mistake was that, like, like so many people, 
when the war broke out, he was thinking in terms of the previous European war, which was the Franco-Prussian War of 1870, which was a very short-lived affair, and people thought it would be over by Christmas. Mm -hmm. But if he'd said, if he'd bargained and said, look, okay, we're going to have to say, if we say the exclusion of Ulster for the duration of the war, or for 10 years after the duration of the war, but if he had had a home rule parliament, mm. and if he had jobs to give out, and yes. all the rest of it, yeah. patronage, power, mm. but I mean, they're in this limbo position, limbo-like situation, mm. that they've achieved their objective. They only have one objective. They're a millennial party, home rule. They've achieved it. Mm. They have nothing to show for it. Mm. Mm -hmm. And they have nothing left to do. There isn't anything for them to do. Okay, now I've got two more questions for you. One, uh, your statement that uh, arguably, some people would argue, that uh, what occurred between 1916 and 1922-23 was not a revolution in Nationalist Ireland uh, because uh, the promise of 1916 was still born. It, the final settlement uh, fell far short of what was expected and hoped for even in 1918 uh, and it led to fratricidal warfare and therefore some people have some block against describing what took place in that period as being a revolution. Yeah. Um, do you believe it was a revolution? Oh, I think there's no question it was mm. a revolution. Mm. I mean, power changed hands in a massive way in which power changed hands. And what is more, the Southern Unions, the people, I mean, there was a very interesting book published as early as 22 and republished in 23 by the then professor of history in, in Trinity, a man called Alison F. Phillips. Mm. And he called it the revolution in Ireland. Mm. And that's what it was. Mm. Power mm. changed hands. It, when power changes hands, it's a revolution. revolution. Now, it, it wasn't a, the, the, the business about it, it wasn't a republic. That's true, they didn't achieve. But I don't think in 1918, certainly, they didn't expect, there were people, there were people like Mary McSweeney, there were people like her brother, there were people like Cahal Brewer, who said when the Doyle met for the first time, the significance of what's happening here today is that we've finally broken the lead link irrevocably with England. Mm -hmm. Nonsense. Of course they hadn't. Mm -hmm. The British army was everywhere. They were in the police barracks, they were in army barracks, they were running the courts, they were running everything. Mm -hmm. That was the theory. Mm -hmm. But Collins didn't believe that they were going to get a full blown republic. I don't think he believed it for a while. Mm -hmm. I think he thought they'd get it eventually. Mm -hmm. But no, mm -hmm. I, I don't think, no. But I mean, that's one of the reasons. There are, there are a couple of reasons why Irish nationalists are slow to ascribe the title of revolution to it. One of them is those that the Republican did to disappoint, but they won't give credit for what was actually achieved in taking over power, in the way in which power was taken over when Devlin Castle was handed over and everything else was handed over mm. in 1922. They don't want to give credit to those who didn't go for the Republic, pure and simple from the beginning. The other reason for it has to do with the socialist element, Connolly and the whole socialist uh, tradition. And they don't like it being described as a revolution because it didn't have a social component. Right. And the, 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 the real thing there, insofar as there was ever as there was ever a social revolution about in Ireland, it's the Land Act. Right. And that, that's over. And no, on, go just on, on that point yeah. of the social revolution. I mean when he was being all interviewed for his biography, it was really a semi autobiography by his niece. Arthur Balfour said, the island of the Irish Free State, Free State is the island that we in the Conservative Party created. Mm. And in terms of the land acts, the land settlements, land ownership, structure of local government, he was right. The social revolution was over. Right. And, and that's why socialist republicans don't like this guy. Okay. okay. Um, you're very critical of the quality uh, and the naivety of the Irish negotiators in the Anglo-Irish oh. Treaty um, uh, discussions, particularly Arthur Griffith. Um, you, you regard him as hopelessly out of his depth. Well, it's not, but I mean, you know, can you imagine if Martin McGuinness and Tony Blair, to go back to the analogy you made, yeah. the and a, Martin McGuinness and Jerry Adams. Are, are negotiating with Tony Blair, and at a critical point in the negotiation, 
Martin suddenly turns around and says, well, I don't know what Jerry's going to do, but I'm going to sign anyway. Mm. No. Mm. No. I mean, vanity, whatever, but just disaster. Utter, total disaster. Mm. I mean, they were all out of their time. I mean, there was a, there's a colleague, very good friend of mine, who's a senior diplomat in the Irish Department of Foreign Affairs and very much involved in British-Irish relations 20 years ago. And, and uh, he read the book in TypeScript. When he read the chapter on the negotiations, he said, he said, I'm both embarrassed and ashamed, he said. Yes, he said. Okay. I mean, they were terrible. They were just out negotiating. But you see, did Devil Air realise this was going to happen? Yes. Mm. Okay. Finally, um, if we were to say to Ulster Unionists um, today that um, it was their antecedents, their grandfathers, who introduced uh, the concept of violence or the threat of violence to achieve political change, um, or in their case, to, to retain the existing political system, uh, they, they, they would take umbrage. They would be very, very angry. They, 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 they would be very annoyed that they, in some way, the UVF, their ancestors, were the antecedents of uh, Pearson 1916 and the IRA and all the rest of it. But you state quite clearly in your book yeah. that that is the case. Yes, absolutely. Right. Um, it's very interesting. I'm going to talk in Belfast, actually, I'm giving me a keynote address on, on um, Monday week, and it's commemoration stuff. And, and, and um, you see, I think if, if they were being intellectually honest, now, this would be politically very unhelpful. Mm. But if they're being intellectually honest, what Ulster Unionists, if Ulster Unionists want to commemorate the events that enable them to establish a st state in Northern Ireland, they should be commemorating the Lauren Gunrunny. Mm. They should be commemorating the setting up of the provisional government. Mm. They should be commemorating the mass rallies in Balmoral and in, in Craig's house. Commemorating the song? Well, okay. It's commemoration of sacrifice. It didn't have anything whatever mm. to do with the establishment of the okay. state of Northern Ireland. And you have reservations about uh, what we're about to embark upon now, the uh, decade of commemoration. Absolutely. Could you just briefly... Well, I mean, very briefly, I think there's a difference between commemoration and history. Uh, and and uh, I think commemoration is an entirely laudable, if perhaps rather a utopian political objective. Mm. But commemoration, as opposed to celebration, by definition, means taking into, into effect the other person's point of view, the other side's point of view, and not uh, doing anything to take anything that will have to sit up. Mm -hmm. And if you want to tell the truth about what happened in the past in history, you are going to say things that are going to upset people. So, um, how do you believe that um, 1916 should be commemorated? Uh, um, I think it should be, I think the event should, should be marked as the 100th anniversary of the, of the event that ultimately led to, to a form of independence five years afterwards. Didn't achieve anything at the time. Mm. Uh, I suppose from that point of view, what you're commemorating is, because that's what it was and it did work. I mean, but <laughs> it becomes tricky. You're, you're commemorating the blood sacrifice. Mm -hmm. That's what you're doing. And I mean, if, you, if, if that doesn't mean anything, then 1916 doesn't mean anything. And do I detect in your hesitation uh, a concern that it may be used a uh, hundred years on to justify the tactics and philosophy of modern day Irish Republicans? Well, that's always a risk, yeah. That is always a risk. Mm. Uh, but I mean, that is, you know, um, and I'm so certainly utterly, totally opposed to the use of violence in politics, but I mean, I think you've got to recognize that it has been used in the past. Mm. And you've got to recognise that when it has been used in 
passed against the governments of parliamentary democracies. It's worked. 